Um, today, originally I was going to have about an hour and a half to talk about WebSockets, HTML5 communication. But, um, so we'll see how far we get. I'm really going to give you the, the most important piece here is it's WebSocket. And then other communication, HTML5 communication, uh, such as server-sent events, uh, cross-document messaging, XML HTTP request level two, interesting bits and pieces of HTML5 as well. And we're going to you know, look at those if there's some time left. Um, and I will post these slides also um, either at the Americana website or on our website. I'll um, tweet out about that when, when that's up there. Um, feel free, though, to come after the, the conference and, and talk to me about um, any, any questions you might have, because we need to really lock up at, at 9.30. So, um, OK, so let's talk about WebSocket. So more and more applications these days require real-time data. Um, you know, you think of financial applications, and, and people are no longer happy with just a static web page or a page that you might need to refresh. So of course, um, that, that has led to, like, it, it's basically just what people demand these days. Um, think of social networking, uh, financial applications, smart power grids, all kinds of applications that, that really require you to have live data in your, your web page. Um, problem is, with HTTP, uh, that is not really possible. And therefore, people are polling the servers for updated information. Now, there are a lot of problems with that. And, and here's just two real life examples for, uh, it just happened in the last two weeks, right? So this guy put a car bomb on, the, on Times Square, got on the plane. Why? Because the no-fly list hadn't been pulled from the server yet. That happened every two hours. He just got through. And so they were fortunately got him off the plane. Um, this oil rig, I was just listening to the news this morning, the, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the data. So they're having a really hard time reconstructing what's happening because there was no real-time feed of data sent to the, main, the mainland where they, they were monitoring all this. So it, it's, it's pretty amazing, and it, it's, it's real life. And, and why is that not possible? Why, why are people not just getting real-time data? Um, because the HTTP infrastructure is simply not there. It just cannot. It's a a one-way street. So it was originally designed for document retrieval. Get, you know, a get request, get a web page, and then you, it, the server responds and gives you the object you're, you're requesting. So that is, the, the traffic can only flow in one direction at a time. And so that's a little bit of a problem for um, real-time data because you need to constantly ask the server if there is an update, right? a, a, a poll to the server, if you will. Um, each of these requests, they carry out on top of them a lot of header traffic. And I'll, I'll show you that in, in great detail in a little bit. So of course, just refreshing a page is, 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 not, <laughs> is not good enough, right? So people started, you know, you can click, 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 refresh. But then, of course, Ajax came around, and that was in around 2004, uh, Web 2.0, really, with Ajax, with, with partial page refreshes, with um, ways to make, the, make it appear as if you had real-time data. Because to the end user, it really was almost impossible to distinguish, because they're not looking at what's happening under the covers, right? So for an end user, it was sort of a, a, a user-perceived notion of real-time data. Um, but under the covers, there was a, a, a real nightmare. Uh, it, it was a nightmare in the making. Uh, this polling approach to, to keep asking the server is uh, typically referred to as Comet, like basically streaming data from the server to the client, a one-way stream to the client. Um, that's that's term uh, Comet. There's no... Um, specification for it. There's no real um, you know, implementation that is preferred. It's just a lot of techniques under an umbrella term of common. 
And what that means is that if you want to talk to one of those backend servers, if you want to talk, let's say, to a chat server from a client, from a browser client, then you can't because similar to like a desktop application that has a direct socket connection to this backend, the browser can only speak half duplex. Information can only go in one direction at one time. So to solve that problem, there has been an enormous amount of glue code invented on applic application servers to literally sort of translate that TCP connection that the app server has, like a Java app server it might have a, a direct connection to the chat server, and it would then translate it on behalf of the poor little browser that just cannot have this, this full duplex communication. And that led to enormous amount of hacks and ways to sort of um, you know, figure out how you can keep a connection open on the server and, and, and make it quote unquote optimized, but you're always on this fundamentally flawed uh, HTTP, which is not flawed in a sense, but flawed for real time bidirectional data. So there are three ways uh, that I'll, I'll discuss real quick of polling the server. The first one is literally a poll every so often, right? And let's say every second you might poll the server, is there an update for me? And that is at a set interval and you send a request and you get a response back. So that means that in, in um, high message, in, in low message rates, you're sending, let's say in a chat case where we're chatting and all of a sudden I walk away for lunch and during my lunch hour, the, the application is polling the server every second, right? Um, this works okay in, in very high message rates, but not so much in low message rates. Every request and response, there's the, the HTTP header traffic. So along comes long polling. Um, effectively, it's a clever way of keeping the response uh, open on the server until there is actually some data. So this works great for that chat case, right? You have a chat message, of the, like the, the lunch hour, uh, walking away from your application. It wouldn't send data unless there was data. So as a result, there's a lot less network traffic. Still, every request and response is still accompanied by that same header traffic, but there's a lot less of it. Now, the thing is, if you have very high message rates, if you have multiple updates, uh, maybe 20 or 30 per second, then this becomes, this starts spinning into this continuous loop of request response, because it, as soon as there is uh, a round trip has been made to the server, it's already there, the data is already there. And finally, streaming, which um, effectively never finishes the server response, is a way to you know, make a request and then the server sort of Hold, keeps it open forever or for a certain period of time and literally just gives you little chunks of your messages. So this is highly, uh, so this is very good and very, very efficient because you don't have all that header traffic every time, except in many cases, um, proxy servers will buffer the, the response and there's a sort of an inconsistent experience on the, on the, on the user side because when there's in real life, there are firewalls and intermediaries like proxies that, that basically can break that. So it, they are not used to having part of a response. They, they're expecting for a complete response and they're built all around that. Okay, so I'll give you a little demo here. Okay, so I have a, a Java application here. Um, it's doing three things. So one is it uh, connects to an active MQ uh, message broker and it connects to a stock topic. So it's basically a simple, um, sorry, this, this one is sending stock data to a stock topic on the ActiveMQ message broker, uh, similar to like RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ. So um, the polling stock is the, the piece that I, looked, I showed you earlier. It's this piece where there's a JMS client on the application server that needs to talk to the message broker. In this case, that's the ActiveMQ in the backend. And then the client needs to talk half duplex 
So it's using an HTTP, XML HTTP request. Um, it's getting this HTTP request, sends it over to handle stock data, and then when the response is finished, it takes the response and effectively parses it and plops it in a table. So a very simple um, application. Let me run it. Okay, so this is slowly starting up here. So as you can see here, the, to the user, and this is not a very pretty demo or anything, but it's just a stock ticker with live updates. So the, there's data coming from the ActiveMQ message broker that's, that's getting it from a stock feed. It's um, taking that data and, and every second or every so often, it's literally pulling the server and saying, okay, give me your latest updates. And then all at once, the page, and that's why it's a little bit choppy, um, is just updated. So if you look at the bottom here in, in the Firebug, you can see how this is just an incredible network hammering going on here. This is uh, every request and response is accompanied by that, that overhead. And I'll take a look at that here in a second. So I wanted to show you another application, um, G Poker. Actually, let me do something else here. Let me start up a tool called Wireshark and start a capture on this network interface. Okay. And do a capture of all the wire traffic um, as it as it's happening. Okay, so here we go. Now I'll go back to this site. This is not a product that we built. This is an actual, um, and this may be some inappropriate content here. <laughs> <laughs> no kids in the room, right? <laughs> so um, this is a a poker game, poker game we found on the internet. It's using uh, an, an XML HTTP request, basically a polling approach to get the game data across. So in, the gaming is a good example of where you, why you need um, this, this real-time data, where you need bidirectional communication. You need to see the state of the game, in, in this case, the, the poker table, but you also have a, a separate channel in which you need to send your move data. Now this is, it looks, crappy. And let's see what's happening under the cover. So I have here a way to filter this traffic. So what you see here is that at the very beginning when it started capturing this stream, is this is the, the, the HTTP traffic that's going over the wire. That's what Wireshark is really good at uh, looking at. So there's the initial uh, get and, and the response from the server. That, that's basically just the um, getting the, the chrome of the page, right? But then as this keeps going, uh, let's see here. Here, this is where um, you can see it pretty well here. It's kind of highlighted. I'm not sure it comes across on the screen well. Um, Every, like the, the game data that you're interested in, the, the moves that are made by the players are effectively just this little bit of data here. And around it, you can see how um, this is the, you know, the, the HTTP header traffic, and, and this is just going on and on. The HTTP header traffic is ways bigger than just that message, the data. So as a user of this application, I'm just interested in the game data. I'm not, I don't care about sending all this data back and forth. And you can see how this would at some point start slowing you down because there's a lot of unnecessary data flowing over the wire. It's just, um, it just goes on and on and on. Every move that's made in this game has, is going back and forth with uh, lots of data. So those are some comet style polling approaches and, and, and that's sort of um, a, a lot of how that's done these days. Um, here. Okay, so I ended up saying, okay, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. How much data is that really, right? So I, I went to actually, I took one of these um, header 
the, the, you know, the request and the response headers, and literally just counted the characters. So you can see there's a lot of data being sent that's really unnecessary, like the cookie data. I didn't need that every time I made a move. Um, the response as well. So in this case, it came up with 871 bytes of data that's being sent either, well, in the polling stock example, it would have been every minute, or every, every second, sorry. Um, in other cases, it can be every time a move is made in the poker game. 871 is not, like, that's not the number, so you can have as much as 2,000. Uh, that's not uncommon. And you can also have, um, you can also have less, but that's just what my browser ended up sending. Now, like I said, for the, for the end user, that's really not a problem, right? They're playing the game, it works, uh, no problem. But if you look at scaling that application out, if you were tasked with taking this application and making it work, let's say for a big poker tournament where lots of people were coming in to play or, or to just watch the game, then you go to 1,000 um, clients, now you have 6.6 .6 megabits per second hitting your network. Uh, 10,000 clients, 100,000, you do the math, right? So at some point, with 100,000 clients connected to this application, you're literally, your, your network is going to fall over at some point. So the, 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 the bottom line is with all of this Comet stuff, you have all this extra overhead, you have uh, complex ways of keeping everything in sync and to sort of simulate a bidirectional bi directional traffic is really hard. And the end, and one of the main things is the end data source, that message broker or the chat server, it doesn't have a direct connection anymore with that front end client. That, that's all they wanted to do is talk to each other. But they don't have that anymore. Um, and that's all, that has to be, on, in the middle tier you have to kind of make those guarantees all the way to the browser now all of a sudden. So all of that, that, that complexity, it's just, it, 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 once you start scaling it out, it literally just starts falling over. So that's why we ask you to vote no on tin cans and string communication. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll show you the, the way around this. Now, this is great because HTML5, um, and you've heard a lot about it tonight, it defines WebSocket. It's a, an API as well as a protocol to really solve this problem once and for all. So it's a full duplex uh, text-based socket connection for your browser, and it allows web pages to, um, to communicate with a back-end or a remote host, right? And we'll look at what that might be in, in a little bit. So the nice thing is, you could say, well, I can have a Java program and, and just punch a hole through the firewall and then I have a socket connection. The thing is, this would do it over the existing HTTP infrastructure. So what's nice about a WebSocket is it can just be done over port 80 and 443. It sits basically, it's an upgrade on top of HTTP. It's HTTP based and then it upgrades to WebSocket and I'll show you that in a second. Um, it's also cross-domain capable in the specification. So I have a quick question. Someone fast, what does WebSocket have in common with model trains for a beautiful Kazing flash drive? <laughs> Not you. <laughs> What's that? Modular. Modular. Speak loud. Tunneling. Tunneling? Ah, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'll give it to you. <laughs> Pass it around. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> they both go through tunnels. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, actually, the, a, a funny anecdote about this is uh, Ian Hickson. You're probably all aware of Ian Hickson is the spec lead for HTML5. And he um, is a model train uh, enthusiast. And he tried to connect a browser to his model train controller. And was having a lot of problems doing that with the traditional approaches. And so he was doing that through the Comet style applications that, we're, that I just showed you. And at some point, I guess, got frustrated with it and um, put TCP connection in the HTML5 specification. And that's actually when, um, that's actually when uh, Kazing kind of jumped on it and said, hey, we're, we were suffering the same 
from the same problems, right? It was like such a mess. It's like, wow, this is really it. And we just went full, full bore ahead with um, developing the WebSocket API as well as the protocol. So um, possible, since you, you can have a direct connection now with a remote server, the, the remote server doesn't have to be your WebSocket server, right? You can simply use a WebSocket enabled server to talk or, or basically get proxy right through to the chat server you wanted to talk to or the game server or um, any sort of WebSocket enabled um, backend or any kind of protocol you might be speaking on top of it. I'll show you that more in, in a little bit. So WebSocket defines two schemes, just like HTTP and HTTPS. There is um, WebSocket and WebSocket Secure, WS and WSS. And as I mentioned before, the connection, th there's an initial HTTP connection, which is upgraded to WebSocket, and then it, it's, it's on, on top of the same TCP connection. So that's an important piece. That you're not spinning off yet another TCP connection or anything. It's literally done on top of the existing one you were already using to make that initial request. Once that is upgraded, you can start sending messages in both directions at the same time. So this is the, the power, powerful part, right? So you have uh, an initial HTTP connection that's upgraded, and now you've got a pipeline that you can send messages through without any, um, without 871 bytes of, of, of header data, literally just the message itself and, and two um, frame bytes around it. So this is what that um, WebSocket handshake looks like. So you, you still do a regular uh, request, and, but you pass in the upgrade request in here, and then you, the server, if the server supports it. So there is definitely a server component to all of this because clearly any web server can't automatically speak. They can only speak HTTP at this point. So you need a, a, a server that can speak the WebSocket protocol, and then, then you're set. So there's a lot of implementations already out there. Um, let's see. So the frame, the WebSocket frames, like I said, they're very, it's minimally framed with just one byte on each side of the, of the frame. It's the hex zero and hex F bytes around it, and UTF-8 data in between. So the messages are you, you could say minimally framed, just the real data that you need to get over the wire is, is sent. Okay, so let's look at the API usage here. So you can check if WebSocket is supported by using uh, window.websocket, and then you, know, you can act on that. So right now it's, it's uh, supported in Chrome and some of the developer builds of uh, Safari. Now, with WebSocket, it's important to understand, it's a very similar model to uh, regular socket communication programming, where you open a socket, you then set some event handlers to uh, handle events as they come down the wire, because you, you're no longer polling, right? You're no longer sending just a, a poll, is there an update? Is there an update? No, now you're just saying, I'm ready. I'm, I have an open connection, an open socket sent me the data when you have something. And so that's what these are doing. Basically, that on message, for example, is where you would receive a message and then you start parsing it, right? So then you, you handle that data. In this case, it's just a, an alert, but typically this is where you would handle, let's say, the stock data coming in and displaying it in a page. Um, similarly, sending the data is simple. You just make a call to send and you can also close the WebSocket connection. So it's, it's a very simple API. One of the big features of HTML5, as you've seen before in the previous presentations, is simplicity. You know, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's make it simple, and, and that way, it's, it's more powerful that way. Okay, so like I said, the, uh, the browser uptake, um, Chrome 4 Plus supports it. That's the regular version of Chrome. Uh, nightly builds of uh, WebKit support it. Um, there's quite a bit of movement. There's a bug that is constantly being updated in, in, in Firefox, so we may see that coming in Firefox pretty soon. They're really excited about that. Um, 
we'll have a, a beer with Giorgio here in a little bit, and we'll get the scoop. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, that, that's okay. <laughs> Three beers? Okay, three beers. Okay. <laughs> so, is that a secret code, maybe? 9.3 in the third part? <laughs> okay, make note. <laughs> so, if you have native WebSockets, um, you can, in the Web Inspector or in the Developer Console in, in Chrome, you can um, type in window.websocket and you get, instead of um, undefined, you would get uh, you know, native code echoed back. So then you know you have WebSocket available. You can test for that, like I said before, uh, in code before you start using it, of course. Um, so at Kazing, we built a, a WebSocket server that also provides a complete emulation, which makes it possible for you to have WebSockets today, even in IE6 and older versions of Firefox and <laughs> <you know, laughs> prior to... <laughs> there's also some some Flash programs that, that allow you to um, like put a, a library in your page and, and use, like they, they emulate WebSocket. Typically that doesn't work so well when it gets to like a secure WebSocket because then you need to start opening ports. So, um, so there's some, some ways to get WebSockets today. Now, WebSocket's great and as you can see, it's, it's almost like you, you upgrade your little dirt road to a, like a, a super highway and now the thing is, if you don't do something on that, then you have all this great stuff, but you, you're just not taking advantage of it, right? So this is, um, so it opens up a lot of doors because now you can talk directly to a backend chat server or message broker or you know, financial server, gaming protocols, uh, sorry, gaming servers. And most of those are sort of exposing their data over certain protocols. Like for example, a chat is often done over XMPP, like Google Talk uses XMPP. It's XMPP, it's uh, secure. Um, and gaming protocols like, like Darkstar, these are, like to do something useful, you kind of need to either create your own protocol. So you could say, well, I, in my poker game, I, this is how I describe a hand and that hand is, is offset by these characters and so on. So you can do that, and then you're writing your own like protocol, basically, or you can use an existing protocol. So it opens the door um, for web browsers to really become first-class network citizens, speaking protocols that up to now only browsers could do. So, of course, that is not part of the specification, but it's easily built on top of it. Now, there's ways to do um, text-based protocols, but there's even, for example, at Kazing, we have a, binar a byte socket that sits on top of WebSocket, and then you can run any protocol on top of that. So pretty powerful stuff. Here's a couple of applications. So here's a financial application, a uh, recent port of Quake 2 using WebSocket, WebGL. So this is not just WebSocket, but it also has other cool stuff, uh, all kind of cutting-edge HTML5 features, and you can see how this really allows browsers to sort of catch up on you know, desktop functionality. Um, the live feeds of data is a perfect example also for using WebSocket, right? Not necessarily bi-directional, but you can use it also for the downstream, just having a, uh, you know, you set that message handler and you just wait for messages to come in and off you go, you, you just display it on the page. So let's see, I have one quick example here. So here's a um, website of ours um, that has a lot of different protocol clients, like a broadcast news client. There's um, uh, like a, a server log, see where people are visiting Kazing from, um, Twitter feed, but we even have um, a, a plugin free, so basically an XMPP, so an implementation of the XMPP protocol, literally um, on top of WebSocket, and that's just basically you create an XMPP client in your page. So let me just log in here that can talk to a backend. I'm trying not to type my password in front of all of you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just basically, 
Uh, logging in. Um, okay, so see if Arun is home. <laughs> okay, so this is a chat client. So it's an XMPP protocol sitting on top of WebSocket. Uh, no plugins, there he is. Um, so, um, this is just basically my own, uh, my Google chat. <laughs> Good. So, I guess now I'm getting pinged from other people. That's. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so I know she's watching the, the streaming broadcast on this. <laughs> okay, so notice though, this is actually running in Internet Explorer. <laughs> did, they, did they already implement it? <laughs> no, um, this is actually the, the emulation in this case. So this is Internet Explorer, not native um, functionality, but we just emulated that. But in Chrome, it would work very much the same. So again, a lot of this is not, I mean, it's not stylable. It's not, you know, you can't see it, but it's there. And for people developing these applications, they, they can now make much more scalable applications. So, so of course, that's all um, good and well. And, you know, that's all running nicely on, on local host. But when you need to actually deploy that in the enterprise, you know, what happens, right? So um, people say, okay, WebSocket is uh, proxy and firewall friendly. But what does that really mean, right? So we have um, WebSocket itself isn't really aware of any proxies and firewalls. It's just basically that data pipe running on top of the HTTP. Uh, it's upgraded from HTTP, so you get whatever HTTP already has, which is widespread adoption, it's everywhere, and a lot of intermediaries already know how to handle the HTTP traffic. So, but they can still throw a spanner in the works when it comes to, um, with, even with WebSocket, right? So there's a couple of ways, and I'll, I'll show you the, the proxy example in a minute, but there's a couple of ways to, um, make sure that you're, you have a bigger success rate with your WebSocket connection. So if you're just connecting, let's say, from one machine to another, and there's nothing in the way, and you know there's nothing in the way, um, then you're probably not using the regular internet. So um, <laughs> then, then you're doing a test case that is not really likely to be happening in, in the real world. So you can, as I mentioned before, you have WS and WSS. The WebSocket Secure gives you a secure, like a basically WebSocket on top of TLS, the Transport Layer Security, SSL, and it gives you that, that same encryption, and that will allow the WebSocket stream to go through a lot of intermediaries in a, in a much better way, so I'll show you that in a minute. So you can, similar to how you use HTTPS, you can now also use uh, WSS. Um, Proxy servers are often used for security, for content caching, for content filtering in big corporations, and they cause a lot of problems for, for example, the streaming HTTP, the XML HTTP request, the streaming type of approach is often, um, has a lot of problems with, with buffering proxies. They, they, if a request is not a normal HTTP request and response style, then you get into problems because it might hang on to the response a little bit longer. So um, there are two types of proxy servers. So one of them is a, an explicit proxy server that you know about, that you configure your browser with to uh, traverse the internet. So you may, in a, that you often find that in a uh, large corporation, you might see um, everyone is configured to use one browser, uh, sorry, one proxy server. Um, that's an explicit proxy server, and the WebSocket protocol is designed to issue a connect statement to that proxy server. So it's already designed to kind of make you more successful. So if you have that, and then the rest is an, an open connection to the internet, then 
uh, you're most likely successful. But there are also what are called transparent proxy servers, which you don't know about, but they may be in the way and do not understand, at least not yet today, the WebSocket protocol. So it doesn't understand. So for one, they're, they're supposed to strip off the upgrade headers. So the traffic, when it finally, when your request finally, the upgrade request for WebSocket finally arrives at the, uh, the target server, it doesn't even know you wanted to upgrade the WebSocket. And then if, even if it didn't strip it off, you would get in a lot of problems with, um, you know, the, the, once it finally starts sending WebSocket frames, then the, the proxy server will completely uh, not understand it anymore and, and, and keep going. So um, I created a little proxy traversal tree. <laughs> uh, there's an, a nice article about it um, on InfoQ. Basically, the bottom line of this whole conversation is if you use WebSocket Secure, then by virtue of having the TLS, like basically having the, your, your wire traffic encrypted, proxy servers are much more likely to just you know, let that traffic through. And therefore, you will have you have a very good chance of succeeding. If you don't, then it's kind of hit and miss. So that's that, that left half of the diagram. You, you have a transparent proxy and then a, another one. So you, you just don't know what you're going to encounter as you're going to your target server. You may have uh, your network, but then there's other networks you have to traverse as well. Okay, so a quick word about other intermediaries. So there's load balancers. Um, and firewalls. So load balancers, typically TCP-based load balancers are actually work pretty well with WebSockets, whereas HTTP, because they're very much geared to that sort of the HTTP traffic and the request response, that they, and because today there are not a lot of load balancers that are WebSocket aware yet, and that, that will change over time, um, they may run into some problems. Uh, firewalls. So, um, Typically, the firewalls aren't so much the problem. Be and, and again, this comes back to the fact that you're using WebSocket over that the first request is a HTTP, regular HTTP request. So if that gets out of the firewall, then the chances are you're, you can also make that WebSocket connection. Um, you may still need to use a WebSocket secure connection, but that that's, um, it isn't that much else. And what's nice about that is you no longer have to punch holes in the firewall, right? So you can no, you no longer need to say, okay, well, for this Java program, I need to open a port, and, and then, you know, network administrators don't like it, but on top of that, it starts to become less and less secure. Okay, so give you a demo. All right, so this is a poker game we, we put together as a sort of a WebSocket demo. Um, okay, log in here as Sean, and here as Rocky, those are my two sons already playing poker. <laughs> here. Okay, so I'm logged in here and play a game. Here, let me just get. So this is a pure JavaScript. There's, there's no, no plugins. It's using WebSocket um, under the covers. And let me see here. Still using the Wireshark. Okay, so connected now, and now both clients have a WebSocket connection. So that same, well, oh, already done. So <laughs> let me actually, okay, so, all right, so there's a timeout where it just keeps going. So and there we go. See, so you can see both playing. Check, check, check. All in. All in. There we go. <laughs> all right. That's the, the theme of WebSockets, all in. <laughs> all right, so let's see. Okay, I go back and forth. Rocky wins again. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a basically a, a regular, so this is pure WebSocket. This is not using a protocol. It's basically using that same sort of like custom protocol, like basically just describing the moves in, in cryptic format and passing that over the wire. So the, every time a move is made, some data goes, flows over the wire, it's an update, and then also there's a sort of a, it's broadcast to all the clients. Now if we look at the traffic there, 
um, that be this one in Wireshark again. And remember, this is like using Chrome, so we have a native WebSocket here. Okay, so uh, I guess I don't have enough game data, but the, here's an example here. I need to play more. But here, here's an example of, like, I captured it earlier. Um, you see literally, I mean, there's the initial um, re request and response with the upgrade header. Um, that's when the, the people log in. Then only the essential game data is sent over the wire. So literally you get... Uh, and this is not even optimized or anything, but you basically get essential game data over a WebSocket only. I'll try to get this one more time. Right, there, here, here we go. Okay, so this is, this is that, that data. And you can see, once that WebSocket connection is established, it's literally just the game data flowing over the wire. So there's no uh, you know, 871 bytes for every move sent across to all the connected clients, right? So imagine this was a high stakes poker game tournament online with you know, a million people watching. That would just simply not work with the, the old polling methods. So remember the, the, the 871 characters. So now the same data for 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000 clients is um, reduced to like, for in the 100,000 case, it's like 1.5 megabits per second. To put it in perspective, you have a massive uh, reduction in network, unnecessary network throughput. And, and literally, um, it, this is one area, right? So in eight, one of the design principles of HTML5 is that, you know, evolution, not revolution. So it's not trying to say, okay, let's change everything around and let's, you know, just just do something that will work with the old stuff. Make it make it work. I, th I think WebSocket is sort of an exception to that in that it's not just a little bit better. It's not you know five percent better than polling. So I guess what what's the incentive for that, right? Um, this is a real a, a, a quantum leap forward in network uh, unnecessary network throughput reduction. On top of that. Imagine that every request and response have to go back and forth to the server. In the, in the WebSocket case, once that connection is opened, you no longer need to uh, have these round trips back and forth. So you have about a third of the latency uh, or, or better. So you have a reduction in latency, reduction in unnecessary throughput, and it's just, it's, it's just great all around. Um, Ian Hickson again, uh, reducing kilobytes of data to two bytes, and then 150 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds for the latency. I mean, that's not just a little bit better. That's that's seriously that becomes seriously interesting. Now, um, what I'm going to do is um, put these slides about the communication up. I'm, I can probably step through it real quick. Um, we won't have a lot of time to do like a complete in-depth about the communication, but basically there are three um, three other interesting areas about HTML5 communication and um, cross-document messaging, XML2, and server-sent events. And um, cross-document messaging effectively allows you to talk between any JavaScript context, so iframes, tabs, windows, and pass messages back and forth in a in a secure way, in a in a, using the origin concept. Um, typically, you have the same origin policy that would prevent you from doing that. But with an origin, if you're passing the origin back and forth, you you can on both sides when you're accepting messages, you can check if it's an origin you trust. And the origin is made up of a, a scheme, host, and port. So you can, in your communication, as, as Giorgio alluded to earlier, you can, uh, you can define who you trust. You can set up a trust boundary and, and communicate with only those sources that you trust. So um, let me show you an example of that. So the sending of a message is simply using post message while the 
receiving of messages is once again done through event handlers. So you have uh, you set up a message handler waiting for a particular message. You check the origin. That's the important thing here. Uh, see if you trust it, and then process the messages based on that. Um, the good news here, um, it's supported in every modern browser already. So that, this is really great. And you can build um, a lot of good applications with that. Uh, I'll quickly step through XHR level two. And I, like I said, I'll post the slides and you can read them in more detail and there's a lot of other uh, articles about it as well. Basically, XHR, uh, the, the API that made Ajax famous, uh, never had very good progress events and also had some uh, a limitation of not being able to allow cross-origin access. And now, in XML HTTP request level two, supports progress events as well as um, cross-origin XML HTTP request. I'll jump through the code here. The progress events that are exposed are load start, uh, progress abort, error, load, load end. Before, there was just the ready state, and you had to query that, and it wasn't implemented in the, in the same way for all browsers. So that was kind of a pain, and now you have a much better um, and a more uh, simple way of querying that. You can also, in this case, uh, for example, this is how you can check up, uploaded progress, right? So there's, there's many nice things you can do with this a API, and we won't go into all the details. But, for example, one of the things is if you have a, um, this would then require some, server-side support again for cross-origin resource sharing where a server can allow you to send those particular headers. It's almost like the header equivalent of that, that, uh, that origin and allow you to communicate, again, based on that origin concept to you know, speak to another origin. So that, this makes it possible to, for example, create applications that can do, like say like a portal style application that doesn't need to wait on server side aggregation, but literally can open, you know, a, create a portlet to one origin and then to, to a completely different one as well. So it opens up a lot of uh, possibilities. Supported in Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. Finally, the service and events. Of course, you could argue that so service and events is a way to standardize the downstream, the a, a downstream from server to browser. And you could argue that once you have a WebSocket, you really don't need service and events anymore. And that's, that's true, except that it's an HTTP base. You don't need a new protocol for, um, for service and events. And it's compatible, therefore, with, with all the current infrastructure. But it is true that, so it's only for the server downstream. So you can use that perfectly for broadcast scenarios and, and other things, but you cannot talk back at the same time. It's not full duplex, but it is a nice way to say, sort of standardize all of the, the comet hacks that we're trying to figure out a way to um, send a downstream to the client in some very convoluted ways. So it, it sort of simplifies that a little bit. It also has the concept of uh, reconnection and event IDs and so on. The support though, um, so this would be an example scenario where a news feed or a Twitter feed, so things where you don't talk back, that would be a perfect use case for uh, service and events. Things where um, you just need the streaming data. Again, you can totally, you can easily do this with WebSocket as well. And um, let's see here. So you, you create, it is very much the same model. You create an event source. You set handlers for events coming down the, the wire. And again, there's no sending, so it's just listening to events. And a good example would be a, a news broadcast. Um, support for that, it's um, partially supported in Opera, uh, development going on in Firefox trunk. Like I said, I think some of this may be a little bit stalled simply because you know, if you're gonna get WebSocket, then you, know, you don't really need that anymore. But um, there's still, valid use cases for that. So, got a minute or two for questions? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. 